everybody. I think I'm live. Here's the question I got today. Isn't sugar real food? If you've wondered that, if that question is um, resonating with you, you're not alone. You're definitely not alone. And it just means I've got my work cut out for me. So isn't sugar real food? Um, before I go into the, to the why it's not, um, we're going to do just a little unraveling of culture and propaganda and capitalism um, so that we can look at why so many of us think that white sugar is a staple food and that it's real food. And um, let's go. You ready? Welcome to live Q&As with me. I'm Darcy. I'm the creator of the Vibrant Woman program. I am a founding member of Math Method, uh, certified health coaches and practitioners. I got that title that it's, that's one of the titles that means the most to me. I think aside from uh, my title of mom, maybe, um, might be one of the ones that's most important to me because I earned that certification living through these principles. Uh, nose to nose with the work of my coach and mentor, Dr. Phil Maffetone, and um, you know his paradigm shifting his, all of his work is very paradigm shifting because he, for the last many decades, has been talking about something that we're just now beginning to understand in the mainstream. It's still swept under the rug a lot, and we're going to get to that today. CI is short for carbohydrate intolerance, and every human being has a certain level of carbohydrate tolerance. What we have done in the modern world with our bad lifestyles and our really bad processed diets is um, we've elevated this problem <clears throat> and it's creating metabolic disease in all, all generations now. Metabolic disease used to be saved for the older folks and um, you know for the first time ever we are just seeing disease rates skyrocket among children. We've got children with type 2 diabetes now and higher rates than ever before and it's a problem and that's why I'm here. Um, this is something that I have lived the power of understanding how nutrition, movement, rest, those are the three basic components of how to sort of live in a healthy human body and keep it healthy across the lifespan. Um, well, <clears throat> and the biggest one I think of course is food and nutrition. I've definitely lived the power of that in my own life. Um, I invite you over to my blog where I tell the story of how I use these principles to help my daughter outgrow her neonatal brain injury. I use these same principles to basically outgrow without pharmaceuticals, um, just walk the path from illness and burnout, um, the adrenal fatigue that I experienced and all of the fallout from it. Um, I was supposed to end up on pharmaceuticals for the rest of my life because I was in such bad shape and I didn't. Because once you treat the root cause, um, the symptoms will go away and the body is far more capable of healing than we've given it credit for. One of the reasons for that is that not very many folks in the healing modalities um, really understand the power of nutrition. So, <laughs> welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I'm delighted to be here. And um, so let's just dive right in, shall we? This question today, and let me just say, if you are here with me, I want to see where you are from. Just say hey from wherever you are. I love connecting live with folks here, and I love answering on-the-spot questions. So um, never hesitate to just throw out a question. If I'm saying something that you want clarification on or that sort of um, you know inspires a new question within you, that is always the best, and I'm here for that too. So without any further ado, I want to answer this question and then talk about um, a related question that I get a lot. So yesterday I was having a conversation um, here on social media with some folks about they're talking about label reading. And the reason for that is because I have a label reading workshop coming up on Saturday. It's in a few short days. There are some seats left. I'm going to put a link right around here somewhere um, so that you can come over and sign up for my label reading workshop because that is Oh, that's just a first step, people. It's a first step to know what's in your food and if it's really food or not. And so that is one of the things that happened um, in this conversation that I was having on social media. Is like I said on a, a label, a package of food that had you know this whole paragraph full of stuff in it. I said I only see one thing that's real food, 
Um, and a lot of people who have been following me for a while who know me pretty well could identify what that was. And But then there were some other questions. And one of them, a very, very sincere question was, well, wait, isn't sugar real food? And I said, no, it's not. So I have been simmering on exactly how I want to explain this ever since then. It's been about 24 hours. I live and breathe this work. This is probably the hill I will die on, meaning it's if you only ever did one thing to change your health and you stop stopping eating sugar um, would be the single most powerful thing that you could do. It might even be enough to help heal your body from all of the things that are going wrong in it now. And I know that sounds like a radical thing to say. It's just that I have lived this. Um, if you had told me 15 years ago what I just said, I might have been skeptical too. Um, and that's why I do the work that I do. Um, for folks who are interested in learning more, come and schedule a free discovery call with me. Let's talk about my private one-on-one -on -one coaching packages because there is only so much you can learn with words and trust me, I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to give it all the words that I can find to try to paint this picture, to help you see um, this from a slightly different perspective, to help you see into this new paradigm where I'm pointing, okay? I'm going to use all the power of the words I have to help people get their heads around this, okay? Because it is, it's, it's, a, it's a change, what I'm pointing toward. But when you live it in your own body, when you actually have that aha, visceral experience, when you have your insulin levels um, normalized, when you have your A1C levels normalized, when your blood sugar is stable, when you are free of your cravings, when the pain goes away because your inflammation is um, less, there is just no replacing that lived bodily experience with words. And um, this is the experience that woman after woman after woman is having in my Vibrant Woman coaching experience, in my coaching program. Now, I also offer something really incredible called the Vibrant Woman course, and I'll talk more about that in the next several months. We're gonna be um, getting ready to offer that again because I'm equally passionate about that course and what it teaches women in terms of getting in tune with their body, their wisdom, um, this entire system that I have created to make it very simple, step by step by step, to begin to heal your body. But the problem is, knowing it is just not enough. You really need to live it. You need to do it consistently. You need to live it in your body. You need to have the support of somebody who has also been there when you get ready to hit your bumps. So anyway, that's a pitch for my coaching program. And now I am gonna use my words to do my very best to help you see what I can see. Why sugar is not real food. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, sugar is not real food. And what we really need to do is define, this is something I talk about all the time as well, it's really time to redefine food, all right? Because I'm gonna say something here, it's a little bit radical. Um, I should have asked you all to buckle in. <laughs> buckle in for live Q&A Q Wednesdays with me because I'm gonna do quite a bit of myth busting. It's just time. It's time. We have to bust these myths. What you see, the majority of the things lining the shelves in a traditional grocery store in the Western world, at, at the very least, um, are not food either. I just want that to settle over you for a minute. A lot of what you see in a grocery store would not fit my definition of food either. So is sugar real food? It's not. A lot of what you see in a grocery store is also not real food. And here's what I'm advocating for. The people who come up close and start working with me will understand this. We need to redefine food because what we have are, we have things that are ingestible. All dog owners know this is a thing. Just because your dog ate the sock, doesn't make that sock food. It's ingestible, it's edible, it doesn't fit the definition of food. So much of what comes out of a box or a bag that I see people use their hands to put into their mouths, to put into their bodies, is just like that dog eating a sock. 
It's not food. It's ingestible. Um, but I think to, to really have a good working definition of food that guides us toward health and wellness and longevity and well-being and heaven forbid I say this word thriving, heaven forbid you go from just surviving in your body to actually thriving, what would the world look like if people felt good in their bodies most of the time? What kind of energy would we have available to live and love and sleep and play and create if we weren't constantly running from fixing one bodily broken problem to another? What might our cultures look like? What would our societies look like? What would our families and schools and cities look like if we were a majority population of thriving people? We know right now we are not. We know where this paradigm is leading us. We know the rates of, of diseases. We know the wait time it takes to get in to see a, a nutritionist or a doctor or a dietitian. All of those people licensed and um, with oversight from federally regulated uh, departments lobbied by corporations getting rich, selling you food-like products, okay, period. So that's where we are. So when I get a question like, is sugar real food? I just, my entire, I just, I explode inside. Every cell in my body explodes with both excitement and a little overwhelm because I can see this so clearly and I wanna share it in the right words. So. Here's what I want you to understand. Just because something is ingestible doesn't mean we should describe it as food, okay? I think food should be limited to those things that grow or occur naturally on our planet that when they are consumed um, and taken into the body, they, number one, contribute to the energy that the body needs, and number two, they contribute the nutrients that the body needs to be well. And number three, that they do no harm. And I think if we can't meet all three of those criteria, we just cannot describe it as food, all right? And so let me, let's just go through that criteria then with sugar. Um, sugar, does it occur naturally on our planet? Yes, it grows um, just like grains do as a grass. And so here's the thing. When I say grow naturally in the environments on our planet, I mean that you should be able to like pick it and eat it. Or in the case of our proteins, the, the animal proteins that human beings thrive on, that we've thrived on for millennia, and that doesn't mean we're not going to get into a moral discussion here about whether you should or shouldn't eat animal proteins, but they are part of a nutritious diet. They do provide plenty of excellent nutrition for the human body and brain. Um, you should be able to kill it and eat it, okay? So in the case of meat, that's a drumstick. It needs to be cooked. Yes, there might be some minimal processing. I'm going to pull the feathers off, okay? I'm going to cut it apart into pieces that I can cook. But a drumstick, not a chicken nugget, okay? Do you see the difference? And if it's something that we're looking at in terms of growing on the planet, we should be able to pick it and eat it. That's um, a tomato, okay? Or a piece of fruit, an apple, a pear, a raspberry, not a fruit roll-up, okay? So that's a tomato, it's not ketchup. <laughs> so we've got this whole thing going around too, like about, um, this is probably a topic for another day, plant-based. Uh, everybody says, you know, our food should be plant-based. Um, in general, yes, but there are some folks manipulating that phrase to confuse us, and I, that's definitely on the list for next week. But the point is, you should be able to kill it and eat it, pick it and eat it. That's what I mean by naturally occurring in our environments. Okay, so is sugar cane, which is where sugar comes from, um, is it naturally occurring? Yes, as a grass. Have you been in a, in a field of sugar cane lately? Have you picked one of those and eaten it? Same with wheat, same with your rye or your barley. All of these staples 
um, that are by and large indigenous to agrarian cultures in uh, northern and western Europe, by and large. Um, that was an experiment. <laughs> that was a human experiment. And I think we can take a look around at where capitalism has led the, the leading edge of that experiment here in the hands of capitalism, right? And see where that is getting us, all right? So <clears throat> is sugar real food? Well, it does occur naturally as sugar cane, but the process from getting those pieces of grass into the white stuff that we scoop by the cupful into our processed foods um, is a long process. Not easy. Um, and it includes doing some harm to the environment, to people, and to that food product along the way. Some of that harm then is transferred into the human body when we eat it. So it's not all that natural. Okay, It's not like picking your broccoli. That's very natural. You can just pick it, wash it, eat it, pull the worms off and eat it. Okay, so, <clears throat> so that's one of the criteria. Is it naturally occurring? Mm, kind of, not really. Grows as grass. We do a whole lot of crazy stuff to it to try to get it into the form of granulated white sugar um, that we're used to eating and that we're used to the taste of and that we're used to the texture of and all of that stuff. The other thing is that I said when it comes into the body, it should be providing some nutrients, not sugar. I'm actually going to make this argument with grains as well. Um, there are, there's not significant natural nutrients there, not by the time it has been through its processing to turn into flour, to be combined with a couple of other ingredients, to be put into that thing that goes into that box, onto the truck, onto the shelf, and then, you know, into your cart and, and whatever. So no, there's not significant nutrition. Um, and we are talking about sugar in terms of the white, sweet stuff, cane sugar, but I'm also, the reason grains gets lumped in here as well is because we need to redefine sugar as well. While we're at it, redefining food, we need to redefine sugar. Um, I highly encourage you to come over to my YouTube channel and watch the hour-long video that I've done with my mentor, Dr. Phil Maffetone. He, um, he breaks down so many of the myths that we hold in our culture about sugar and what it is, and it's just enlightening to hear it directly from his, um, his perspective, his genius brain, and his words. Um, so I invite you to do that. I'm going to paraphrase here for a minute just for our purposes today. You know, sugar is not just the white stuff that's sweet. It's all the white stuff that's um, processed into flour. So all the flour stuff is sugar as well because it turns into sugar immediately um, upon entering the bloodstream. And so it has the exact same impact on our blood sugar stability, on our insulin response, on our A1C levels then, right, which is over time how our blood sugar is handling the ups and downs of uh, this, you know, this glucose insulin roller coaster that we've got going on from eating this processed diet. So, so those flour products turn to sugar in the bloodstream. They also are nutrient um, deficient, like there's no significant nutrition there, which is why all of the um, bread products, and you can see it, it's, this started in my, my generation when we were kids, um, they started fortifying these foods. So they add, so they strip it all out in order to process it into the flour that we use to make all, we think we make a lot of different foods. And I say to people like, if you're eating bagels and pizza, and pretzels and cracker, like you're not eating a variety of foods. You're eating two foods in a lot of different disguises, in a lot of different looking boxes, but you're eating the same two foods. So sugar and, and flour, basically. And it all turns to sugar in your bloodstream. Now what they did is they started fortifying these because they realized they're stripping all the nutrition out to get them processed so finely as, as they do. Um, and particularly what they add in, they add in a bunch of stuff, but particularly what they're adding back in are the B vitamins. When they're fortifying with B vitamins, they are using synthetics. Those synthetics are not well recognized or even remotely usable by the body. And what has happened um, over this generation or two now 
of folks being um, very high, their diets being very high in stripped nutrient deficient, uh, hyper fortified with synthetic vitamins foods, the human body has actually adapted to that with a gene mutation called the MTHFR, you can look it up, MTHFR gene mutation has everything to do with the fact that if you're heterozygous for this or even if you're homozygous, you cannot even use your natural folate now. Your body is, is deficient in its ability to process folic acid because it's been trying to adapt to, this, to the environment of your terrible processed hyper fortified foods. So um, this is a topic to go, we'll go deeper on on another week's Q&A as well. I think this will be up next week as well, but look it up. The MTHFR gene mutation means you can't process your folic acid. Folic acid is critical for um, the brain. So, so depression, anxiety, learning problems, all of that related to, to this. Um, also because folic acid is important for um, a fetus in your utero, Women that have this problem are more likely to miscarry, to not conceive at all, to have shortened um, luteal phases to their cycle. Like, this is a whole thing. And there's a lot of people out there chasing symptoms, trying to figure out all these mysterious um, symptoms, and they're totally related, and they're related to the, the gene mutation that we've got going on. As many as a third, as many as about 30% of um, adults in Western cultures now have this because we've been eating fortified grain products. All right, so does it provide, is it naturally occurring, sugar? Mm, we talked about that, grains too. Um, <laughs> does it provide nutrition? It doesn't, except the synthetic stuff that we've just discovered uh, should not be there anyway, so that does not count as nutrition. No, those are harmful. And then the third question is, does it provide energy? So this is the other question that I sometimes get, and I want to bring this up and answer it now because it's a related question. So isn't sugar a good source of energy? Well, the answer to that is also no, it is not. Um, what we hear a lot in terms of sugar for energy is that um, we, our cells require glucose. Well, yes, there is a, uh, there's a piece of that that is true. Many of our cells do require glucose to burn for fuel for their cellular processes. But the problem is there are only a handful of cells that actually must burn glucose. Most of the other cells in a human body were evolved to and prefer to burn fat for fuel. And where we have gotten into trouble, um, I discuss that in, this almost every single week in this Q&A in some form or another is this understanding of um, this metabolic problem that we are programming our body's cells to burn sugar by the way we eat so much sugar and foods that turn to sugar. And we are um, very high in stress in the modern world, so we're not getting adequate rest. Um, or we're not getting adequate recovery because our workouts are too high and stressful. So we're training our bodies to burn sugar and we're feeding our bodies sugar. And now we have this terrible roller coaster um, of number one, low energy and fatigue. And number two, metabolic disease because the body is trying to adapt and it just cannot keep up with this and be well. Um, it's a recipe for disease is what it is. So the problem is a lot of us think that in order to have energy, we need to eat some sugar. And one of the pieces of evidence is just like, oh, look at those kids when they're all sugared up and they have all that energy. Well, a, a sugar high, um, number one, it actually doesn't feel good. I don't know if you, the last time you've ever done that to yourself or really taken a close look at the way those kids are behaving, they don't feel good. Um, Number two, it's not sustainable. So what happens after a sugar high is a sugar crash. Um, that doesn't feel good either. Um, and again, these highs and lows, this is, a, this is the recipe for metabolic disease. It impacts um, children's brains, adults' brains. It impacts um, 
every aspect of our metabolic health. This is not the way energy was meant to be um, created or used in the human body. So what we need to do instead is get back to the basics. Through evolution, our bodies prefer to burn fat. Most of our brain cells will prefer to burn fat as well, and definitely the body cells can survive burning fat. But we have them, like I said, we've got it set up wrong. So is sugar a good source of energy? It's really not. Glucose is necessary for some of the cells that are not keto adaptive, that can't switch to fat burning. Um, but that doesn't mean we need to eat sugar for that little bit of glucose. That little bit of glucose that's actually necessary and um, a, a little is the right amount because then it doesn't require the insulin response that comes out and removes the glucose and causes you know the blood sugar high and then the blood sugar low, um, <clears throat> which is where your cravings start all over again and you go looking for some form of sugar and then you know there we are. So I help people get off this roller coaster. I help them heal their bodies and their brains from this. Um, it does mean that we have to change the way we eat, the way we move, and make sure we're getting adequate rest. Those are the three basic pieces to this. But the idea is that little bit of glucose that, that certain cells in the body do need can come from your, your vegetables. Okay, there's plenty of glucose available there. It can come from some of your protein. The body knows how to make uh, glucose from, from those sources. And the rest of the cells will be actually much, much happier burning fat and even in the healthiest and leanest among us um, there is plenty of stored fat available for um, for unlimited energy and that is the promise of switching over into a fat burning metabolism that my program offers is this idea of unlimited energy um, so just want to leave you with that thought so is sugar real food it's not um, it's not all that naturally occurring because it's highly processed it does not have nutrition in it. It um, is not a good source of energy for the body. And let's go to the fourth thing there then is that it should not cause harm. But unfortunately, refined white sugar and refined flour products, all of those that turn to sugar immediately in the bloodstream after being consumed, they do cause harm. Um, how much time do we have? <laughs> uh, I'll just give you a couple of the basics, the way that they cause harm. One is that blood sugar instability roller coaster that I've just described to you. I describe it almost every week in a Q&A session. Um, it's this idea that too much glucose hits the bloodstream. It is a toxin. So you do not want glucose circulating in your bloodstream for very long. If it touches tissues, um, it's a toxin and it's very destructive. So Insulin comes out to take um, the glucose and deliver it into the cell. You, I think you already know this part of the story. The cells are insulin resistant simply because we've already been doing this and overdoing it for too long. So the energy doesn't get into the cell. Where does it go? It gets converted into fat um, and stored in the body. It'll be stored as a glycogen is sort of a glucose backup in our liver and some of our muscles. And then the rest just gets stored as fat. And you can see what's happening to so many of us. Um, you know, I, I'm certainly not someone who agrees at all with making judgments about size and shape of other people's bodies. But what I am here for is for you to tune into your own body. And if you feel you have too much stored fat, you're probably right. You're probably right. And too much for who? Well, for you, for what feels good to you. We all need some, we need some stored fat. It's, it's a healthy layer of fat that protects us from damage from the sun, um, that protects and insulates our organs, that keeps us warm in the winter, like there's, keeps our brains going and humming along, healthy fats. But if you have pockets of stored fat on your body in places that don't feel good to you, um, you don't have to gaslight yourself out of that. You're allowed to say, you know, this doesn't really feel good and well and healthy to me. And I'm going to learn about metabolism and diet and nutrition and movement. And I'm going to learn how to get my metabolism um, back on track so that I can burn some of that. So that my cells can, can be efficient in repair. So that my body can be efficient in um, building itself so that my body can be um, 
pain-free because a lot of the, the root of all of this is inflammation. That's what's created when we get to the, to the tipping point of metabolic disease, which is what I'm really talking about here. And it starts with your blood sugar stability. It starts with what you feed yourself. And so many of us have been programmed to eat this way. So let's talk about why this is such a valid question. Is sugar real food? Well, because it looks from our culture, if you, we don't have to go back very far. And this, this brings up, I don't know about you, images of red and white gingham tablecloths, you know, and, and round elderly white haired grandmothers full of hugs that smell of flour and sugar and aprons on and pies in the oven. Now that is, that's a culture. And I want us to just look carefully at where that culture has led. Do you know how many people of that generation have metabolic disease or have passed away from advanced stages of metabolic disease? And we continue to sell and perpetuate the myth of, of the healing apple pie. It's not healing. It's making us sick. So, there we are. <laughs> That's why sugar is not real food. The refined flour products that so often go with it, they're also not real food. Um, I can feel a bit of a collective sigh. <laughs> I have it too, like that's kind of a sad myth to bust. We wanted that myth to be real. We wanted it to be true. We wanted grandmother's cookies to fix everything. We wanted the love she felt when she made those cookies to land in our bodies and heal us. And that stuff made us sick and it's still making us sick. And if that's how you're showing love to the people you love, you're making them sick. And I'm sorry, but not sorry to be the one to share this. What I'm hoping to do is to tell that truth with enough integrity and compassion that the folks who really need to hear it because they don't want to be sick anymore are ready to take that next first step now which means we have to change what we eat. For some of us, it's gonna feel like giving something up. Um, I definitely felt that way in the beginning. I don't feel that way anymore. Um, so the folks who come into my private coaching package, it's definitely something that we talk about and you're gonna get support around that piece because it's a bit of a reinvention of yourself. But here's the beautiful thing about that. The self that you're reinventing is one that will be leaving pain and inflammation and metabolic disease behind. So you really do get to reinvent yourself and you get the opportunity to create a human body that's vibrant, that thrives, that heals, that becomes stronger, that becomes more energetic, becomes more alive. And every step along that way, every step on the path, on the way to that thriving, you and your body will become more intimate. You will begin to see the symptoms as what they truly are, a message from your body that she's doing her best to keep up and um, that we just have to continue to listen and provide the nutrition in the form of real food that she's asking for. And remember, real food will be naturally occurring it will provide nutrition, it will provide nutrients, it will do no harm, all right? So that's what I'd like to do is leave you with that and invite you to just take a look at the way that you're eating and ask yourself, be very, very honest with yourself. Are you eating things that feel normal that are actually doing you harm? This can be a little tough. Um, and I still sometimes do it because I, I learn to make a new kind of treat with a healthier this or that or ingredient. And the next thing I know, I'm making a third batch on the third day and eating all of them. And I have to get really real with myself and say, no, wait a minute. Am I using this food to nourish my body or am I doing harm with it? Okay. 
So it just starts with being real honest right there with yourself. Um, and to begin to notice how your body responds to certain foods. I really think that is absolutely the key to all of it because your body's trying to tell you. With the heartburn, with the pain, with the weight gain, with the lethargy, um, whatever your symptoms are, sleepiness after lunch, um, whatever those symptoms are, your body's talking to you. And it's about time we listen, wouldn't you think? I do think. I think it's time. So, um, the last thing I want to leave you with is this idea that sugar then is often hiding. And I am the furthest thing from a conspiracy theorist. I just know this is how these companies work. They know how we think. They want us to buy. Um, so they are very crafty about the way they do their labeling. And um, I have learned quite a thing or two in my decades of label reading and learning how to find the best, most nutrient-dense food and avoid the junk. And I wanna invite you to join me on Saturday. There are still some seats left. Come, I'm gonna put the link nearby. Come over and take a look at what I'll be talking about on Saturday in my label reading workshop. It's called Only Eat Real Food and How to Know the Difference. And um, we're gonna figure out what words mean sugar, where they are on the label, we're going to talk about what macros matter the most. A lot of us are looking out for things like sodium and fat. I'm going to say that you've got other, um, we've got more dangerous kids on the block that we want to look out for on that label. We'll also talk about um, why the vitamins added are not a good thing. I gave you a little information about that today, but I want you to look at, a, at the vitamin panels with me. We're going to have labels pulled up and I'm going to go through and we're going to talk about these things. I'm going to help you understand what some of these ubiquitous um, words are, things like dextrose and maltodextrin. They're in everything, so they must be okay, right? Wrong. Um, but I'm going to help you understand what some of those word roots are and how to recognize the bad guys in the words, which boxes to put back. I'm also going to help you um, with my little grocery store map. We're going to talk about where to find some of the best things, especially for breakfast. What we see is just a lot of junk coming out of boxes and bags for breakfast, and I would much rather see you eat real food for breakfast and feed real food to your kids. So I'm gonna share with you my most nutrient-dense, um, stress-free breakfasts, and you're gonna leave with a whole week's worth of menu ideas. All right, so come get in that workshop. It's um, Saturday, this Saturday, August the 20th, 3 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern time, and um, we're gonna, we're gonna just uncover all of this and make sure that you have the tools to know, um, again, what's real food and what's not. What belongs in your cart? What goes back on the shelf? And of course, the recording will be available afterwards, so you're welcome to watch and re-watch that. If you can't make it live, come sign up anyway and you'll get the recording. Um, there's a place in the registration um, sign up space where you can put questions there as well too. So you're welcome to ask your questions right when you sign up and that way I will know all of the things that you need me to cover in that 90 minute workshop to give you the knowledge you need to empower you to only eat real food. That is my wish for you beloveds. It is absolutely my heart's desire to share um, everything that I have and everything that I know to get you to eat real food. And I know the power, the transformative power of this on your body and brain. So. All right, that is it for today. Thank you for being here. Next week, we're gonna talk about mushrooms. Are they good for your A1C? And we're also gonna talk about the things you should be taking um, to keep your cholesterol in check. Cholesterol is a big issue these days and we're gonna uncover it next week. So I'll see you then. Thank you so much, take care, and only eat real food. <laughs>